just so. gonna interview whatever. It's not gonna distract me. I won't think about it all the time. I won't check Zillow. I won't, you know, come on. No. No, they, they just said, you know, come early, drive around the town, see what it's like. And the, the president of the university basically said oh, I have to get a new staff. Oh, that's what uh, it is. I think that's great. Right. <laughs> He's presidential. presidential. Right, I was, yeah, nice, but they were spending uh, time. Okay. You know, yeah. So I, I spent two days it's driving around to see it. It's a nice, I would actually watch with a moment. So. It's uh, really functional. Yeah, it's uh, there's no way to not project him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that's not just that true. Yeah. Um, or if you want to see on the screen, imagination. Yeah. We if we put it like this, yeah. it should be a little bit of show up on the. Uh, and the further you get down, the camera, camera can erase this. Process that emotional mess. Uh. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I I got the no on Thursday, and then I got a call on Friday from another person. It was good. Good process. Uh, I don't know if I get the psychology. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. But I'm glad you got it. Good to see you. Uh, yeah. People on the I should get people online. So, uh, hopefully, they'll be able to see the. Oh, you're going to see that here. Maybe you should read it. As a I, I, yeah, I will as well. All right, let's get started while uh, Nick is uh, writing the slides online. Uh, it's my really great pleasure to uh, introduce Nick Paget, uh, who uh, was supposed to be with us, and in some way was with us uh, last year. He was a senior visiting fellow at the center, uh, but he had the unfortunate, uh, uh, it was unfortunate that it was during the COVID year, so we were unable to, uh, to, to meet in person, but the rest of the year went very well despite, uh, despite being online. So uh, Nick is LAS, I don't know what it stands for, Distinguished Professor at the University <laughs> of Illinois at uh, Chicago. He works in the philosophy of science, in the philosophy of physics, as all of you know. He's published widely in this area, quantum theory, quantum mechanics, space, and so on and so and so forth. I don't take too much time. He's published uh, several books. Uh, uh, Everywhere and everywhere in 2010 with OUT, physics with philosophy at the uh, Planck scale in uh, 2001. And he's leading uh, a John Templeton Foundation funded project uh, with Chris Rutzrich called Space and Time After Quantum Gravity. <coughs> and out of that, at least one book will be uh, coming out. And Nick told me that it's pretty much done. Eight times. <laughs> uh, it's quite good, and we really delighted you were able to uh, to come to uh, talk to us. As I mentioned, there's actually quite a few people online for, for for this lecture, so we'll be able to take questions from uh, the participants online. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Edward. And it's you know it's really is a pleasure to finally be here, having right spent a semester sitting in my bedroom at the desk virtually in in Pittsburgh. Um, Maybe I should say there are already two books out, but written uh, anthologies that have, have, have come out out of the project uh, in the last couple of years. So anyway, thanks very much for having me and let's, um, let's, get, let's jump in. So, okay. So what I'm gonna to talk to you today, about today um, is some joint work from a paper that I'm writing with uh, Niels Linnemann and, and Mike Schneider. Um, so I wanna thank them. It's still something of a work in progress, so we're actually very keen to get sort of feedback from people today and um, see that how we're, how we're doing. Um, and that also sort of means, yeah, there's a bit more on me. I'm not just presenting a finished product from the three of us. So of course, um, the good things I thank them for, and the bad things you can um, blame on to blame on me. So, ah. So I wanted to let people know, I mean, who are here. And um, if you're watching, you can actually download the a PDF of the slides and it's shorturl.at and then K-M-O-S, lowercase, capital B. It's on the board over here as well, but I don't know if that, it looks like it's probably visible. So feel free to download and follow along if you like to have the slides. Okay, um, a very quick sort of introduction first. So it's customary to start 
talks about quantum gravity, especially talks about sort of empirical quantum gravity by um, pointing out the extreme difficulty of probing the relevant Planck scale physics. So I will not depart from custom here and I'll make this point, um, but I make it with a couple of caveats. The first one is, of course, insofar as the predictions are those of general relativity or quantum mechanics, which most of the leading contenders for theories of quantum gravity recover, that's not true at all. There's lots of um, predictions that the theories make that, are, that we know to be true. The problem is, of course, it's very hard to test the novel predictions. Second, it also depends a little bit on what you mean by quantum gravity. If one was to include semi-classical gravity, as um, David Wallace has been arguing very nicely recently, there are, of course, um, tested novel predictions in cases where we use quantum um, semi-classical uh, uh, gravity. Um, we don't use quantum semi classic we don't count in our use of quantum gravity. Um, we don't include semi-classical gravity. Okay, but with those two caveats aside, the question that's gonna, gonna be trying to, people have been addressing recently, and we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about in this talk is something you don't get from semi-classical gravity. How can one observe the characteristically quantum nature of gravity or of quantum gravity? So here's some things you might think of to try to do that. I mean, the most obvious thing is to think of analogy with electromagnetism and consider, you know, can we have some sort of gravitational version of an, uh, the photoelectric effect, you know, the observation of, uh, of photon emission. So, but this is a nice example of the way in which it's very hard to, you know, the inaccessibility of um, Planck scale physics. For instance, if you think about a hydrogen atom and the transition from the N3 to N2 um, excited you know, electron orbits, you know, for um, the electromagnetic uh, sort of regular photoelectric effect, um, sorry, that, so this is the electrical potential energy is about 10 uh, um, electron volts. And so that produces an observable photon, but the gravitational potential energy in, involved in that drop is 10 to the minus 38 electron volts. So even if a gra graviton is emitted, it's going to have so little energy that you're not going to be able to see it. So there's no hope for something like a photoelectric effect for gravity. Something you might think of instead, perhaps more promising, would be to have an interaction between a quantum state in superposition, interacting with the gravitational fields and becoming entangled with it, and so seeing decoherence. People have thought about that sort of proposal it would be much easier to do than the photoelectric effect, but still very hard and beyond current technology. Well, what I'm going to talk about today is the study of uh, what are known as uh, what some people call gravitational Schrodinger cats, or I don't like this neologism, but that's what we we'll use for short, grav cats. So the idea is that there could be systems small enough that they fall in the quantum realm, and in particular that you can keep them from decohering, so you can actually have superpositions of states and see the superpositions, but big enough that they have you know, gravitational fields that are actually going to have effects on the system. That's the kind of range we're looking at. And that's interesting because the technology on both sides, bigger systems that maintain coherence, smaller systems but still gravitational, those two regimes experimentally and practically are coming together. And there is hope that in sort of the next 10 years or so, they might overlap enough to actually reach this regime. So there's a lot of excitement because this seems, you know, a kind of experiment that actually might be kept possible in the next sort of few years. And lots of people are trying, currently working on how to actually carry out such an experiment. Okay, so that was a sort of quick introduction, even quicker outline. So two parts to the talks, I'm gonna set up the relevant physics. I'm gonna give you a very naive description of the GravCats so you can see the setup and what's going on and what one expects. I'm going to try not to double click. 
explain how this experiment would be sort of decisive against semi-classical gravity. Going to then look at two different ways of, of going back to more fundamental physics and understanding what's going on. One we'll call the Newtonian model, the other we'll call uh, what's well, a class of tripartite models. What's significant here is these seem to deliver different verdicts about whether the effect is actually quantum mechanical or not, or at least whether um, gravity has to be quantum mechanical to understand the effect in the different models. So with that set up, I can turn to the questions of interpretation, which really is a focus, focusing on that question. Well, suppose one did the experiment and saw the expected results. Given there are these different models with different interpretations of what's going on, would we really be seeing quantum gravity and in what sense would we be seeing it in a laboratory? Imagining somebody setting this up on the tabletop and doing the experiment. And well, there was another quick one there. If I have time, I may talk a bit about other th there's a, an, another set of questions about what motivates the experiment. Okay. So the physics first to make sure people understand what's going on. So we'll start with a very sort of simple minded analysis. Again, as I say, this to explain the setup, the expectations. And we will see in a couple of slides, however, the very naive sort of just way of approaching things here can be made more rigorous. One can start with more fundamental physics to justify um, this approach. So you can imagine, a, you can sort of suppose that there's a GravCat system and in so one of the original papers, they were thinking this is the kind of thing you might be able to do if you had two very small pieces of diamond, um, 10 to the minus 14 kilograms each. That's the sort of size of thing one's thinking. And I guess look at the picture first. So there's two of them. One is located at, let's say, location minus, or is um, centered at a location minus D, and one at a center is centered um, at, a, at a location plus D, but there each one is in a superposition, in a position superposition. So GravCat one, in fact, is a, is a sum of a superposition of a, a wave packet um, displaced by delta to the left um, and a packet uh, displaced to the right. Okay, 50-50. So each one, each, GravCat one is a state of left plus right. GravCat two is a state of left plus right. So this is just a mathematical identity. You can write out the state is separable, but we can write it out as a superposition of terms, um, which correspond to sort of each term corresponds to a definite GravCat one position and a definite GravCat two position. Okay, so that's the basic uh, setup. And thing to notice is each of these four terms corresponds to a different uh, gravitational potential. Well, actually two of them are the same, but they correspond to different gravitational potentials. So for instance, we think about the first left left term, that corresponds to a pair of grav cats, both in the left position. So a different, a distance of 2D apart. And so one expects a potential of, well, gm squared over 2d for that term. There's also, then if we leave the system um, in this configuration over time, that means there's going to be a phase developing for that term that depends on that particular potential. Okay. The second term corresponds to uh, grav, GravCat one on the left and GravCat two on the right. So this is the left right term. These are further apart. They're a distance 2D plus two uh, delta apart. And so they're gonna have a, a smaller potential and they're gonna develop a phase according to this formula. Of course, the right left ones are the closest. So this is gonna be the greatest potential here. Okay. The upshot is that over time, these different potentials 
lead to different phases for the different terms. And so after a certain time, there's going to be um, relative phases developing between these, uh, between these terms. And I guess just a note, I'm not, we're going to assume that they're not moving to start with. The force isn't great enough or the time long enough for them to start moving. So I'm going to ignore any, any kinetic energy terms. We just look at the gravitational potential terms. The result then is going to be a state of the form that I have up here, which is now an entangled state. This is now because of the different phases. This now is not separable. I can't now write this as a product state for the two graph cats. And this entanglement um, can be observed. So that's the that's the if, you know, the positive result one is expecting. Leave the grab cats there for a certain time. They'll go from being unentangled to entangled, and that's something that can be observed. Uh, I'm not going to discuss how, but that's a question you might have um, for later. So the claim people make is that such gravitationally induced entanglement would be a witness. Um, the entanglement itself, they, we, one would say, was a witness of the quantum nature of gravity. And so observing the entanglement would amount to an indirect observation of the quantum nature of gravity. And again, the exciting thing is, this is something people think could be doable in the next decade, that sort of time scale. Okay. So let's just raise the question for now. We're gonna dig into this a bit. Is that really right? At least in the model we've used now, all we did was appeal to a Newtonian potential. And that doesn't look particularly kind of exciting as a sort of quantum phenomenon. Now it's true, it's a quantum potential. So I've got the hats on the positions. So it's certainly quantum in that sense, but still, what way are we really seeing something quantum here? More, there are actually people who do deny that we're seeing something quantum here. So I want to unpack what's going on uh, a bit better, a bit deeper. Um, okay. The first thing to say is that I was just wondering, all right. Is there a way to like move that off to the side or down to the bottom? So I don't know, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it's not really bothering people. I don't see a cursor. Yeah, don't worry about it, it's okay. It says graph cats versus semi-classical gravity. People don't see it online, online you can see. Ah, okay, so it's just people here have to, have to start. I'll tell you what, it, I'll, I'll read what they say so then you'll know, it'll be okay. So the first thing to note is already what we've seen enough is to see how this experiment would, would be incompatible with semi-classical gravity. So let me just explain, make sure what I explain semi-classical gravity, what's meant there. So it's semi-classical in the sense that gravity stays classical while matter remains quantum, mechanic, quantum mechanical. The idea is to take the Einstein equation keep gravity classical on the left-hand side, but, on, but now we have quantum matter, so replace the classical stress energy tensor with the expectation value of stress energy for the quantum wave function of, of matter. Okay, so, so the thought behind Oh, no, I was trying to use the, the no, I, Is it advancing at all? Yeah, no, I was just having trouble with the pointer, that's all. Oh, okay. I'm good with that. So, right, the thought with semi, uh, so the thought, right, behind semi-classical gravity is that uh, perhaps gravity need not be quantum mechanical at all. And I kind of mentioned that Craig Callender and I wrote a paper about this a little, about 20 years ago, uh, talking about some of these things. Okay, so what does this equation say? Well, given the, the, 
you know, what the experiment looks like, we can still look in the Newtonian, work in a sort of Newtonian limit of this. And so the expected stress energy really amounts to the mass distribution of the grav cats, the positions. And so what counts is the expected position of the first one and the expected position of the second one. But of course, the expected position of the first one is minus D. So the expected position of the second one is at D because they're the sum of packets that are symmetrically arranged around those two points. Okay. So what do we have now? So for instance, now we'll think about um, uh, the left one. So that, okay, so the, what's rel ignoring self-gravity, the potential that's, not, that's relevant for the left packet is going to be the potential due to a, a grav cat wholly centered at D, which is um, uh, 2D plus uh, delta away, 2D there, and there's my delta there, and so on. Each one sits in its own potential here. Okay. Um, basically what matters now is how far each packet is from the expected position, not from the other packet in the term. So that means this potential, for instance, for the left packet of GravCat1 appears here, because that's a term where I have, the, I'm looking at the, this term involves the, the left-hand packet of GravCat1, and the same potential appears here. Point is the potentials now are independent of the, where the, the location of the other packet. The, the, the phases now that are, that are appearing here, therefore factorize, Therefore, the whole wave function is still going to factorize. This is a factorizable wave function. And, whoop, yeah. and so you can sort of check it out, but that's what's going on. This factorizes, and so there won't be any entanglement. We won't see any entanglement. So there actually is a clean, a clean experiment. See entanglement, you know it's not semi-classical gravity. So this is one sense in which one would be witnessing the quantum nature of gravity. At least we would rule out that it, gravity being classical in the semi-classical gravity sense. That wouldn't be a viable theory. But still, that's sort of a negative statement. One would still like to hear something positive about what's got what in what way one is seeing the, the quantum nature of gravity. Moreover, and I'll sort of flag this question now and hopefully we can come back to it. The people who are involved in this, um, in, the, in thinking about these experiments, generally don't think that semi-classical gravity is a contender theory of gra quantum gravity. I mean, it, it, it's use, you can use it as an effective theory, but it isn't viable as a fundamental theory as a competitor of string theory or loop quantum gravity or something. And so there is a question about what actually motivates doing what will in fact be a very difficult, expensive, time-consuming experiment to carry out. Is the point just to rule out semi-classical gravity? So that's a question I'd like to come back to. Okay. Well, to probe further this question about are we witnessing the quantum nature of gravity, I think what we need to do is push back into some more fundamental physics, as people have done, and see what they say about what's going, what's going on in these experiments. Okay. So, Want to understand the physics better? Want to understand this question on uh, this question better? So the natural thing to do is push back and start with general relativity and the methods of quantum field theory um, and apply them to general relativity. So I guess I didn't say before. There's a slide at the end of the uh, the, the very last slide has the um, citations to the various people I've been uh, mentioning. So I'm gonna to refer to here a nice little paper by Anastopoulos and Hu, which is about GravCat experiments. So actually not directly addressing the question that I um, am raising today. 
So how does this go? I mean, do it very quickly. Start with general relativity, write down an action for a scalar matter field. I'm going to go to linear gravity. So linearize in Minkowski space-time. What one kind of is going to end up with then is equations of motion for perturbation, gravitational perturbations around Minkowski space-time, basically gravitational waves. And then third step is going to be gauge fix. But we'll quantize in a minute, but that's what one's going to do classically. Um, I'm going to note sort of just briefly that the second and third steps, the linearizing and gauge fixing, are not entirely independent here. Uh, but those are the three steps. And what you're going to come up with is, again, I'm quoting um, from Anastopoulos and Who's paper, paper here, a Hamiltonian that looks like this. So there's going to be a Klein-Gordon apart that's, talking, that's, that's describing the scalar field. So it's kinetic energy and interactions. Again, there's not going to be any kinetic energy. And we're going to work in a regime where gravity is the only interaction we have to take care of. So that term's not going to be relevant to us. Second, we have a Newtonian term. And you can see what this is. So this epsilon term is the matter density. It gets integrated over. So basically, this is going to correspond to when I integrate these two things, I'm just going to get the masses of the gravitons. What's going to be relevant is I've got Newton's constant and then the characteristic one over R for the Newtonian potential. The other terms, uh, this term, the gamma T term, this corresponds to interactions between the gravitational perturbations and uh, the, the stress energy of the matter field. There's going to be a term for the um, self-interactions of the gravitational perturbations. And I put in dots in case one wants to go beyond linear gravity, there'll be, you can kind of insert higher order terms. So the key point is going to be in the GravCat calculation, well, there's no kinetic energy or self-interaction of the matter, so that drops out. It also turns out that the gravitational perturbations so these terms don't play any role either. And all we're left with is this final Newtonian term. And so in a, once one quantizes and applies to the, the GravCat, one simply ends up with this Hamiltonian, which is exactly the same one we were working with in the naive model. Okay, so I'm gonna now call this, I pressed by mistake looking up here. So we'll call this model now, you know, the model that uses this, um, this potential, this Hamiltonian, we'll call this the Newtonian model. Of course, it's the same as the one of the, as the Hamiltonian we used in the naive model, but that was just plucked out of the air from classical physics. In the Newtonian model, we're thinking of this as derived by this kind of process, starting with GR and applying gauge quantization. Okay. Since it is the same potential, of course, it has the same predictions as, as the naive model. Okay, so a couple of notes, two points I want to note about uh, this Newtonian term. Now we're thinking about uh, you know, where it's coming from in the theory. First of all, this arises from a gauge constraint. This term here, um, ultimately arises from gauge fixing. And so this represents the gauge constraint. These terms, uh, moreover, it's fully determined, as one can see, by the matter distribution. There's no more freedom in this. So that's to be contrasted with the terms involving the gammas, which are for the perturbations, around the, the gravitational perturbations, in gauge theory, one would normally think of take those talk of those terms as being the true degrees of freedom. That's where the physics lives. That's not fully determined by the uh, by the matter distribution. There is more freedom in those in those degrees of freedom. Furthermore, I said they're gravitational waves. Now we're talking about the quantized systems. So in fact, those represent graviton states. Okay. So that's going to be significant because that's going to do some interpretational work as we go on. 
So, as we have seen, the gravcats, the phases that develop the entanglement, don't require the gravitons. They don't involve that part of the theory. They're not, um, I mean, involved in producing the, the relative phases. And so the thought might be, well, the experiment, well, this is, I guess this part is right. The theory, the experiment doesn't show anything about the quantized nature directly of these, of, the, of gravitons of that part of the theory. If one takes the stronger view that the true degrees of freedom, that's really where gravity is. That's where the dynamical physical system is. One might come to the conclusion I might want to say in that sense, that the gravcats do not truly witness the quantum nature of gravity at all. One take, I, I, I'm overstating things a little bit here, but that's the sort of flavor of the picture is that gravity is really in the true degrees of freedom, not in the gauge constraint. And so we're not seeing the quantum nature of gravity at all. As I say, this is the kind of view um, that this is Anastopoulos and some other authors, um, have, have put out recently. I'm probably overstating a little bit, but that's the sort of, sort of quick flavor of the view that's here. Okay. Let me just take a sip of water and some air. something a little bit funny has sort of happened because we started with general relativity and we sort of ended up with, you know, which is a in which gravity is dynamical and ended up with something, the bit that's left over where it's not dynamical at all. And that seems important because, you know, one of the major lessons of physics for the last 200 years is that fields really are um, dynamical systems themselves. And of course, general relativity is how that lesson gets uh, realized. And we've kind of lost that here. That's not where we've ended up. I mean, in a way, that's the, the point that's being made at, by, by Anastopoulos and so on. Well, we could try to go back and, write, and model the graph cats in a way that respects that lesson. That is, Let's just explicitly write the state down, write that, describe the system in a way that it just makes gravity be um, itself a dynamical system. What's that? What that's going to mean is when we write the quantum state down, we don't have a bipartite state of just two of the two graph cats, but it's a tripartite state. We have to put the gravitational field on the same footing. And we end up with a gravcat, say so gravcat one, an intermediary field interacting with gravcat two. And that's really how schematically we should be putting, should be writing the state. So in particular, one might think if we're going to stay close to general relativity, these gammas could represent the metric fields, the general relativistic metric fields, or, or sorry, quantum states corresponding to. Um, classical uh, metric fields of general relativity. And for instance, if one took the Newtonian static limit in, uh, in general relativity, the appropriate field for, uh, you know, for, for a mass is one that looks like this. So we could think of each, each of the grav cats as producing a metric field like this, okay. Can see it's just basically Newtonian and well, we'll set the potential to be constant on the inside. Capital R is supposed to be the radius of the graph cats. The exact form is not really crucial here. This is the one, this is one that's proposed by um, Crystal Ladulu and Ravelli in their analysis of the graph cats. Um, and as I say, it's the Newtonian limits, it's the Newtonian um, static metric field one that, that one expects. So it's a natural one to use, but the point is these are, you should be thinking of the, uh, the, the gammas as states, 
of the classic is representing different classical gravitational fields, different, um, different uh, states of the GR metric. And so superpositions of geometry in a state like this. Okay. Well, as I said, this, this form comes from the paper by Crystal Adulu and Ravelli. And so if we're imagining different uh, metric geometries for each term, I'm gonna run the experiment. Because of the different geometries, not surprisingly, the grav cats are going to experience different proper times along their trajectories. We're in relativity, so there's phases associated with each, with each uh, term due to the mass energy. So each one, um, each, each pair is a sort of associated with a clock, um, an identical, you know, physically identical kinds of clocks because the masses are the same in each of them. So they're going to be made, those clocks, the quantum phases are going to be measuring different proper times for each of the terms because they correspond to different, different uh, metric fields. So let's see. So for instance, right, so this, this grav cat is, let me say, is closer to, so grav cat, in this term, grav cat one is closer to grav cat two than in the second term, as we saw before. This is the left, 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 right terms. This is closer. So there's a weaker gravitational field experienced by this grav cat, by each of the grav cats um, in this term than in this term. And so, is that right? This term will involve less proper time um, than this term. I think I got that the wrong way around. Oh no, less proper time. And so no, the closer ones will get, right, further apart will be less proper time. The one where they're closer together will have the greatest proper time again. It'll pick up the biggest phase. They'll be picking up different um, phases um, in each term. Not surprisingly, you know, given the form of the metric that was assumed, we're going to get different phases and they're going to be just the same as one got in the naive and Newtonian models since we're working in the Newtonian limit. So once again, um, we get the prediction of um, entanglement just the same as before. But now there's a very strong sense in which the entanglement between the grav cats acts as a witness to the quantum nature of gravity Namely, this state that produces the different phases is a superposition of classical states of gravity, a quantum superposition of classical gravitational states. And you can't get much more quantum than a quantum superposition of states. So it's very clear why we're, why we're um, quantum here. Quick note, I mean, we're motivated, I probably didn't say it enough, but, you know, the idea that gravity ought to be a dynamical system in gravity in GR, that also means that it should be causal. But just note, you know, we, it, causality is relevant to thinking this is the right way of, of modeling things because we think GR and the causality of GR should be holding here. We'll just note sort of formally that's not essential. And I'll thank Mike here especially. You get the same result if you model it in Newton Cartan gravity. So you get rid of the um, you know, relativistic causality. And also note um, in uh, this is a paper by Berza et al., one of the first papers um, to propose this kind of experiment. Um, they model again in a different way with coherent states of the graviton field. So the point here is well, this is where it'd be nice to see the title. This is, there's not just one tripartite model, there's more tripartite models that they share this idea that the gravity in some way is a third system that's mediating the interaction. And that's what's really important here. The gravity is a third subsystem mediating the interaction. So then, as I say here, it's a theorem of quantum mechanics that that third subsystem must be quantum. Okay, I mean, it's a theorem and it's in quantum mechanics. So there are some assumptions going <coughs> on here. Excuse me. And, you know, 
some of those assumptions are about what it is to be classical within the quantum, the sort of quantum formalism. I'll leave it at that. Um, but that's important because it also lets me put the citation to the Marletto and um, Vidral paper. Um, and these two were really the first uh, two papers about the same time to make this kind of proposal. Um, but that's the way they think about it. Okay. So I hope it's reasonably clear, you know, what's going on in the GravCat experiment and the, so these two ways of um, thinking about how to model it. Let me, I am going to, this is a slide that's going to uh, recap that a bit. This series of slides um, are titled Quantum Gravity in a Laboratory. So the first one is going to be a bit of a recap just to make sure we see where we are on the, where everything is. Oh, that's about 35 minutes. Okay, that's okay. So we started with the naive model. I won't repeat that, but we also saw how we could derive the, um, a naive model uh, in, you know, in terms of the, the, the Hamiltonian for the naive model in the Newtonian model, starting with general relativity and applying the methods of gauge quantization. And what we saw was the graviton terms don't play any role in the quant when we get to the end, when we've quantized and modeled the GravCat situation. All that matters is that Newtonian potential, which is a gauged fixed term, not part of the true degrees of freedom in the uh, sort of gauge theoretic lingo. Okay. In the tripartite model, GravCats do witness. Oh, sorry. I need to say a little bit to say about that. And the argument is okay, that because it's only the gauged fixed part of the, um, of the, of the, of the gravitational field that um, is relevant to producing the, the relative phases, we actually don't have a witness to quantum gravity. It's, it's something else. Okay, one would need to actually see the graviton terms playing a role they're the true degrees of freedom. That's where the physics of the field lies. And we'd need to see them quantized to actually have a positive um, witnessing of, uh, of quantized gravity. But there's this other way of looking at it where which we keep uh, the gravitational field as a subsystem. And according to that, well, we won't get entanglement unless the, unless the gravitational field that's mediating the interaction actually is quantized. So of course, if we see entanglement, we have witnessed uh, the quantum nature of gravity. So it's a bit puzzling. Both of these seem reasonable ways to model the system, but they seem to point to different conclusions about what we should, you know, different, about, what, you know about what a positive result shows. So it seems reasonable to ask what's the you know, correct way to model the situation and try to figure out whether seeing GravCat entanglement really would witness quantum gravity. I should say the quantum nature of gravity. Well, I think one thing that one would say first of all is maybe there's just sort of something wrong with the question here. Okay. There's sort of a, to say that there is a correct way is to assume both these, moment, both these approaches start in pretty much the same place. But they make different assumptions as they try to approximate, idealize, take limits to describe the, the, the actual GravCat situation. They're very similar starting points, modeling the same situation, but the kind of assumptions that go into actually creating a model for that situation are clearly different in the two cases. Okay, well, isn't it just entirely logically possible that they end up with predictively equivalent models, but are nonetheless look very different because of the different assumptions that go in? And maybe there then there just is no kind of correct choice here. These are both equivalent ways or equally good ways of modeling things. And if you think about the sort of assumptions that go into them, applying the techniques of uh, gauge quantization. They're perfectly standard in physics. You know, GR, that seems like, if you apply them to GR, that seems like a reasonable approach, although not, not entirely undisputed. 
okay? But it also seems totally reasonable to um, start with GR and think about superposition and think about quantum superpositions of the graph of um, uh, metric geometries as we've done in the second way. So maybe these are just equally good choices. We just have a kind of a, an example of theory laden this. The theory choice is built into the idealizations, approximations, limits that are taken rather than the fundamental theory. And that's just how it is. Okay. I want to try and do a little better than that. Um, at the very least, if that was the case, one would want to understand more clearly what was actually being assumed in the two, two approaches. And maybe looking at those different assumptions will actually help unpack and see whether one is preferable to the other. We can make some sort of more normative sort of judgment about what's the right thing to do here. Okay. So this, you know, being the most interesting part of the, pro of the talk, is probably the most sort of speculative, and this is the most kind of in progressy part. It's also worth saying we've gone around, the three of us have gone around and taking different views on this over time. And I'm, we're pretty close now, I think, to a consensus. Um, but what I'm going to tell you is neither, I think, and I think Mike and Niels are there, so they may be nodding at this point, is neither a total consensus. You know, is neither total agreement or a sort of stable consensus. But I'll put some things on the table and I'd be really interested to, to hear how people would respond to these. Okay, so we've got a slide on the Newtonian model. I guess I'm going to go through each of them and think about the central um, theoretical assumptions. Well, the basic assumption is the applicability of standard gauge quantization to GR. And also some of the law about what that gauge quantization signifies, as I'll make clear. But let's think about the techniques first. It follows from those techniques, and this is just, you know, these are formal facts. The so-called true degrees of freedom, the, gra the gravitational perturbations, the gravitons once quantized, don't play a role in producing the relative phases that we see in the um, in, that lead to entanglement. That's just a mathematical fact about the model. And similarly, it's a mathematical fact. The whole effect is due to a Newtonian potential that comes from gauge fixing. However, to take the further step to sort of talk about whether, uh, whether we're seeing quantized gravity requires a bit more than just these mathematical facts. It requires the um, sort of standard interpretational package that comes with gauge, that sort of often comes with gauge quantization to interpret what this means. It's one thing to define the thing uh, the gravitons as being true degrees of freedom. It's just it takes another step to then say that's really where, what gravity is. That's the physical part of gravity, and we're not seeing that in the experiment. That's the further sort of part of, of standard gauge quantization law that I'm referring to here. So a few points about this. Well, what counts as gauge, how, you know, the way you split the gravitational field into a gauge part and a free part, at least in the get quantization that I've the, um, given, is to some extent not, these are not totally independent facts. Most important, and this is sort of emphasized by people who've replied to this line of thought, the different Newtonian potentials, although of course they're fixed by the distribution of matter, they do different distributions of matter, of course, correspond to different phys physically different gravitational fields. And of course, that's why up until GR, I mean, the Newtonian potential was gravity. There has to be something gravitational. There has to be something physical about the Newtonian part of the, of, of, of the gravitational field. After all, indeed, that is what gravity was basically up until uh, GR. So 
it's fairly brief, but there's something of an equivocation to go from saying, because the um, true degrees of freedom are not involved in, the, in producing the entanglement, we're not truly seeing the quantization of the gravitational field here. There's something of an equivocation on, uh, on what we mean by true. There is still, so this is the, sort of the first part of the argument, just because the gravitons are not involved, that doesn't seem enough, sufficient to say that we're not actually probing the gravitational field here. Nonetheless, of course, the part of the gravitational field we're seeing is what I started with. We just have this potential, this Newtonian potential. And again, there's a little concern. That, you know, the question then is, we've put the hats on. This has to, has to play a role in the Schrodinger equation. But is that enough to say we've witnessed quantum gravity? I'm running out of time, so there's another point I could make here. So, so the upshot with respect to the Newtonian model is, yes, that seems like a legitimate way to try to model things. Does that just show simply in virtue of the fact that um, the true degrees of freedom are not involved, that we're not seeing quantum gravity? We're not seeing the quantum nature of gravity. That seems too, too quick. Nonetheless, it does draw attention to the fact that in this model, it's just the potential that's doing the work. And in what sense are we seeing something quantum? Moreover, since what's doing the work in this model is the potential, I'm going to point out that there were experiments done in the 1970s that already saw that, that the gravitational field of the Earth could affect the phases of uh, there were neutron interferometry experiments, famous cow experiments that witnessed the effect of the Earth's, the Earth's gravity on uh, quantum systems. So in some sense, if that's all there is, we have seen that already. On the other side, so I'm, the, these slides still say the quantum gravity in a laboratory, we have the tripartite model, the theoretical, the central assumptions there are that gravity is an intermediary subsystem. And that's something that it seems like you need if you want space-time causality, which, which you do. Okay. So that again, seems like a good, a perfectly reasonable way to model the system, perfectly theoretically respectable. Couple of objections or things one might raise in response to this way of modeling, however, there seems to be a disanalogy with the electromagnetic field. And this is something that's been mentioned in the literature. If you think in terms of electromagnetism, what shows the quantum nature of the electromagnetic field? It's the photoelectric effect. It's seeing photons. It's not because that we see Coulomb, you know, we see, inter we see uh, uh, entanglement generated by the um, Coulomb field, which would be the analogy. Uh, you know, the, uh, the electromagnetic analogy to the GravCat experiment that we've described. So what's the disanalogy here? It's also worth pointing out that there are classical stochastic models, models sort of gravity, I didn't quite write that out, models where gravity, had, uh, classical gravity with a classical stochastic component that can also predict entanglement. So the Seeing the entanglement would not be an absolute proof of gravity not being classical, but rather sort of relative to a class of plausible theories. That's not really an objection, it's just worth uh, pointing out. So that's about 50 minutes, right? So what time we, I should probably, I have one more slide, but I think. You can do the next slide. Okay, I mean, it's pretty good for me to give a talk that's less than an hour under any circumstances. Okay, I'll, I'll take that as the chair's question or something. To tell me the last slide maybe. Okay, but I'll, I'll try and go quickly here and throw some more speculative um, things out. So I think part of what people, 
say when they're thinking about why doing this experiment is the, the, the very strong point that I made earlier on that it will just rule out semi-classical gravity as a fundamental theory. This is definitely a phenomenon if you see the entanglement that you wouldn't predict from semi-classical gravity. And so we would know that wasn't a fundamental theory, but it's a little funny because very few, maybe nobody, certainly people who are involved in this really take it as a, take semi-classical gravity as a serious contender for fundamental physics in the first place. And it's a very you know, complicated, expensive experiment. Do we really need to do it to learn this about semi-classical gravity? Well, maybe, you know, science has very high epistemic standards and maybe we do need to be ruling out every sort of, you know, everything on the table. Here's another, um, another reason one might sort of think you had for doing the experiment was maybe we could get some data that will allow us to distinguish between string theory, loop quantum gravity, you know, give us some clues about the form of a fundamental theory of quantum gravity. But that's not going to happen. We're working in the Newtonian limit. I mean, all these theories are supposed to agree basically on GR and quantum mechanics, and we're not even in the sort of GR regime. We're you know, in the Newtonian limit. So we're not going to be getting predictions that, that we're not going to see anything in this experiment that does that, that distinguishes between fundamental theories. So we've been talking about other motivations for doing experiments like this. So I want to sort of suggest that these might be applicable here. The first is that experimental science is not just about testing this theory versus this, that theory, or confirming this theory or that theory. It's also about gaining control of new physical regimes, knowing how to manipulate quantum gravity, not just knowing about it. So this is the kind of experiment that carries on after you're already pretty convinced about the form of the theory. There's still work to be done. I'll notice I mentioned the cow experiments before. The experiment that's, pro that's um, proposed here, okay. if you think about it from the Newtonian form, in, in, in terms of the Newtonian model, well, it's an, we're doing, doing an, an, this was an experiment that already put the hats on the gravitational potential because we, we saw quantum interferometry, uh, quantum interference. But it was the, the Earth was the source, and so it was a classical source. The, thing we, the new thing we're going to be getting out is the sources, the, gra the grav cats are themselves the sources, and they're in superposition. This would be the first time of seeing a potential that, um, so basically we've seen that the gravity can affect the quantum mechanics. We'd be seeing um, that quantum superposition affected the potential as well. Okay, we would be having sources that were in superpositions for the first time. Of course, from the um, tripartite view, it's completely different. There's no superposition of gravitational states in the cow experiments. It's just the gravitational field of the Earth. It makes all the difference in the world, but the source is, uh, quant is in a superposition. Okay, so that would be talking about what getting more know-how. We've been moving into a regime beyond what had been done in the cow experiment. Why would one want to do have know-how rather than just knowing, knowing that, knowing that some theory was correct? Part, partly for practical purposes, to develop the, few, the technology so that maybe we're starting down a path where, well, we actually could do experiments like this if we get good enough at it to distinguish string theory from loop quantum gravity. That's a thought. Other kinds of experiments and technology that might spin off from it. I'm more boosting, this is a further perhaps than, than Mike and Niels, very influenced by the sort of entity realists and the idea of one of the things that science actually tries to do, experimental science to do is Make, through, make real, isolate, and bring into existence in the laboratory things that are otherwise thought of as merely theoretical. And one could think of the experiment in those lights. We actually want to create quantum gravity, or we've seen so far classical gravity. We want to produce superpositions of gravity. Of course, I'm taking a stance on how to interpret the experiments to say that. 
Okay. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there because that, that's good. There's a couple more things here, but I will stop there. I think that's plenty. I appreciate everyone's okay. All right. We take 30 second break. For this one, live, we're got a question, please go down to the bottom of the screen, click on Q&A, write your name, and I will promote you to uh, panelists and ask questions directly to uh, uh, the speaker. All right. Hey, how are you doing? Mind if there's a question from the room, repeat it. Just so yeah, sure. Yeah. As I'll ever be. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, that was terrific. I, all I know about this is from what you've told me. And so I can only react to, to what you've said. What I'm seeing here is a pretty significant debate over brown cats. There's one side that says, yes, they're, they're revealing something of the Klondike's character of gravity. On the other side, they're saying, no, uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, forgive me, but I, I think the skeptics are winning this one. Um, when I look at all the effects that you're describing here, I don't see any quantization of gravity. Uh, what I'm seeing are effects of the, the following character. You have two masses, both of which are quantized, so they can enter into a superposition. Uh, then you've got the uh, interaction between the mediated by what is, for all intents and purposes, uh, just a, a, a classical field. Um, if I were to try and write down a theory, in which I would insist that the mediating field did not quantize, it would look like that. Right? It just it just wouldn't wouldn't make a difference. I get I get thinking about the electrodynamic uh, 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 analogy and the point you made is you've got to get you've got to get photons. You've got to quantize the the uh, uh, um, electromagnetic field. I, I, I was thinking about how would you try and run this argument in a case where we have full control of the physics. One, you know, and I just didn't see anything coming out of it that, 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 is, uh, that is quantizing gravity. Uh, there was that argument that came later uh, uh, where you had different proper times or laps. You can just do that in QED uh, or even just you know, charges mediated by a classical field in the Mikowski space time, but just having them moving and then you have time relation effects still. So, anyway. That's just a reaction to what you've said. I know you've had to abbreviate things a lot, but that's how it looks. Okay. Did you want me to repeat that question? Okay. So I think, so I don't know if everybody at home heard that, but I, so John was sort of convinced by the uh, sort of Newtonian model side of things, I think, and you just have the potential and 
that's not showing uh, that, that we have quanti a quantum of nature of gravity in a sort of sufficiently robust way. Yeah, I mean, to some extent I'm going to, uh, but he said it more eloquently and sort of than, than that. Uh, yeah, I mean, to some extent I'm going to, I, I, you know, I, I can repeat the things that were sort of said here. So part, what I didn't hit, so first of all, what I didn't hear and what you were saying was being terribly convinced by this degrees of freedom and the gauge kind of, kind of argument. Say that again. I, uh, I don't think I followed it completely. I, I, I take it the, the idea is that the mediation between the particles doesn't get in gauge degrees of freedom as it would say in an Alan Berger thing or something. Yeah, so, so as I said, I think this is sort of the standard law about, um, about gauge theory um, is you know, when you've done your get when you've done your gauge fixing. You've now split the theory up into a sort of a gauge constraint term, and then the true degrees of freedom, which are where the actual dynamics lives and actually plays a role. So part of the argument that's been made against seeing, and this really is actually the main force, the main way the argument is um, put, is relies on that split. So saying because this at the um, effect or the the relative phases don't depend on the um, true degrees of freedom, the ones that are kind of left over after you, that, that are the left when you've done the gauge constraint, the gauge fixing, that we're not really seeing a dynamical physical, sort of physical effect here at all of gravity. So I didn't hear that as part of what you were saying. So I think you're agreeing with the analysis to the point where I say that really isn't very convincing. Yeah, yeah, no, okay, really but what's yeah. actually left is this potential. Yeah, yeah, I accept that. That's clear. So, good. So I agree. Here, here things are kind of a uh, dice here. So, but still, I want. I guess I do want to push the yes. There's a we're seeing the quantum effect here. First thing, of course, we do see the hats. I think then one can sort of respond, but we sort of saw the hats, you know, this is an operator, it is a quantum object, we already saw that in the cow experiment. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. that's the quantum character of the, of the two material bodies that yeah. is being reflected in those hats. So, yeah. So for the audience, I'm holding my hands out. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I also want to say, I, I, so I'm kind of closer to, a, okay, so I'm kind of closer to saying that the two models are both equally good. So it seems like you do still need an argument. It, it can't be enough to just say, um, right, it's just, a, it's just this potential. I think you have to also say that there's something illegitimate about modeling the system in the sort of tripartite models way i didn't quite get that in the question i guess well, so you said we could do that in electromagnetism as well and i think you're now getting to the point where you would so i had this all on the board right about in electromagnetism it's the photoelectric effect and not sort of um kind of coulomb induced entanglement that we think of as yeah that, that sounded just right so in the, in the photoelectric effect you're actually dealing with a quantized Electromagnetic field, so it's a quantum character. Um, when you have the tripartite model, are there actually gravitons in that uh, in that interaction? You, you've got it. You've got it. I mean, I don't know the model. I just saw what you put on the screen. You had a you had a third ket with two gammas in it, right? And I, I don't know what that is. So the way so. Right, so the way Crystal Adulu and Ravelli were things set it up, for instance, right, each one of those terms represents a like a, a definite state of the classical gravitational field of a classical met a classical metrical space-time geometry. And so what that total state of four terms represents, since there's a different geometry in each one, is a superposition of classical geometries, and that's the sense in which 
it's a quantum superposition, right? It's not a classical yeah. GR superposition. It's a quantum yeah. superposition of classical geometries. And if you have two charges, and as the distance between the charges is different, you get different equals. Right, right. Um, and I don't think anyone's counting that as, if you, oh, so now we're quantized the electric field. At least it doesn't sound like we're quantized the electric field. All the superposition is happening with the uh, uh, weakness of manifolds. Yeah, so I. That's okay, but I don't think that's the right. I I think if anything, this what I would what I would learn from thinking about through this example is actually we should think of that as showing the the quantum nature of the electromagnetic field yeah. as well. I mean, I also want to point out, you know, the kind of argument that you do get on the um, sort of tripartite side is really emphasizing. Look, the gravitational field gravity really is causal and it really is an interaction it really is dynamical and that really should be reflected in in, in the models here so i mean i think there's a sort of i just want to say because it, this was part of the thing i sort of didn't say about the electromagnetic case sort of coulomb in, coulomb entanglement versus um photoelectric effect i think historically it's relevant that we had sort of experimental access to the photoelectric effect much earlier than any sort of coulomb based entanglement which i don't really know when that i, I, I mean that's under, that's something you have to worry about in quantum computing i don't know when any when people actually first started looking at it so part of what's going on here i think also has to do with what we have experimental access to how we kind of think about these things yeah the next thanks so I guess my question is almost is on the same set of themes, but the opposite uh, of John's comment. So it seems to me that it's almost a mistake to think that this idea of witnessing the quantum nature of the electromagnetic, sorry, of the gravitational field is a binary predicate, so to speak, but it's not as one all or nothing that you either witness the quantum nature of gravity or you don't that you slowly get more and more evidence for the quantum nature of gravity by the sequence of arguments and experiments seems more plausible and then if you look at um, the electromagnetic field so it seems to me that something similar happens there as well right so if i look at the hydrogen atom where I have a central Coulomb source, right? And I use that source to quantize uh, the states of the electron. Uh, it seems to me that is at least some kind of evidence for the quantum nature of the Coulomb potential, though we have to wait for a more sophisticated dynamics to understand how those interactions actually happen in a quantum nature. But I think even even sort of before that, I think it was pretty decent evidence. So it seems to me that in analogy with that, you would expect the fact that gravitational sources can give us these kinds of effects would be some sort of evidence that uh, that gravity is quantum mechanical, but of course we'll have to await a fuller study to actually get a full grip on that. Does that sort of track at least my side of this dialectic there? Yeah. 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 So I was with you kind of, I mean, the, up until the very last thing you sort of said about one side of the dialectic, I guess. Um, yes. So this seems to me to be the way I'm thinking about this, right? I'm guessing, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm just based on what John was saying. Based on some of what you were saying, that we would be opposed to, some people would be opposed to this. This way of definition is slowly. I see. Yeah, no, so maybe that, that I, I'm just not quite sure if it maps onto what I think of as the sort of two sides here. Okay. So I think what you're saying is very much in line with, line with what I was suggesting at, at, at the end. It, it, this is kind of very much. Look, there's two ways of sort of thinking about this. Um, yeah, uh, approach. 
And well, in particular, what I was saying on the last on the last slide, kind of rather rather quickly, I think that's sort of the idea of thinking of um, experimental science aiming to get control over these new regimes and trying to get further and further control. So the only, th the only thing I think I was saying differently and probably still would say differently, you still put it as a question of sort of evidence for the quantum nature of gravity. In a sense, I think there's very little need for kind of, <laughs> sort of people feel very sort of less need for that. What they want is to be able to actually manipulate the quantum nature of gravity. So I do like the idea, of, you know, that that might come in sort of degrees that there's more or less, quant you know, more or less access we have to the quantum nature of gravity. And then again, I would point to the sort of cow experiment where we see the effects of the Earth's gravitational field on the quantum states of neutrons. To what's proposed here, we also see a source that's in superposition, and we see sort of see the effects of that. You know. What would be really great is to see the effects of gravitons more directly themselves. I mean, ultimately one thinks of the, gravitation, the gravitational field as some kind of coherent state of the graviton field, but we wanna see sort of the effect more of individual gravitons. As I said, sort of a, a gravitational photoelectric effect seems way out of the question. I think the next kind of step is the thing, I, I, something I mentioned at the beginning where you might hope to see sort of a quantum system gravitate, interacting with the gravitational field and becoming entangled with it so that it lost, um, we, lost coher we lost coherence of the quantum state. That would sort of really show that we needed uh, gravitons to be involved. So yeah, and I'm pretty sympathetic to that. Um, the thing is, everyone thinks those are the things that you know that would happen in gravitation in gravitational interactions. So the evidence bit is a bit. I think it's important to think of it in terms of actually having experimental competence to to actually do these things, and not just in terms of you know confirming or learning All right. that. Enzo. Enzo. Yes, hi to everyone. Uh, yes, I, I, I couldn't uh, hear very well the, the question, the preceding question. Perhaps someone uh, has already said what uh, I would like to say. Uh, I enjoyed very much your presentation uh, and uh, uh, it is clear that uh, to have a, an experimental confirmation that uh, uh, gravity is uh, a quantum phenomenon would be very important and also to have the possibility to manipulate uh, quant uh, quantum gravity would be very, very important. But uh, in general, I, I would like to know what you think about uh, the classical theoretical argument favoring uh, the fact that uh, gravity is a quantistic phenomenon, that is that at plug scale, uh, uh, quantum fluctuation uh, from our theoretical point of view, for our contemporary uh, theoretical point of view, must be there. So in a certain sense, uh, uh, all people uh, from a theoretical point of view think that uh, gravity, not all people, all people that uh, work in quantum gravity, because uh, it is true that many physicists uh, do not care too much about what happened Planck scale, so they they not care about uh, this problem, but all physicists that uh, uh, and philosophers that uh, all, all or almost all think that at, at uh, Planck scale uh, we need uh, a quantization of uh, gravity. Thank you very much. Could you just? Is he still there? Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vincenzo, could you just like summarize the question again in a couple of sentences? I, I, I was trying to take everything on board there. I wasn't quite, and I wasn't quite sure the very thing you wanted me to address at the end. Sorry. Ah, okay, okay, yes. My point is very simple. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, there are uh, enough uh, theoretical uh, argument justifying that uh, gravity is a quantum phenomenon, or we need necessarily? experimental test this is the point ah got it 
So, yeah. I mean, this is bringing back down to the question of whether we need evidence for, you know, for quantum gravity versus classic, you know, whether the, there is a classical theory. I mean, people have worked on sort of classical theories, and I, I mentioned one in the in the talk. It it, it seems kind of logically possible that uh, gravity is classical, um, and I've kind of written this the paper I wrote with Craig Callender. We were we were indeed pushing the need for experimental evidence uh, or you know experimental evidence, um, but maybe I would back off that a little bit now. Um, and say that you know there's a lot of theoretical evidence and indeed thought you know the, that gravity does also need to be quantized um i'd also say you know part of the talk today was written from the perspective of this community and i think even the people on the newtonian uh, model side don't doubt that, that, that their complaint is not that you know that gravity might after all be classical it's just this isn't the thing that's going to sort of show you know that's going to actually reveal the quantum nature of gravity to us so you're asking me to step back a bit i think in the context so let me answer just from the context of this talk and then i think the most relevant thing is again to come back to the slide about semi-classical gravity i mean if one thinks about and that really would be, you know, insofar as there's sort of evidence of something in this experiment, you know, assuming it's done and the entanglement is shown, it is the unviability of semi-classical gravity as a, uh, as a quantum theory of gravity. And in a sense, that, that was what Craig and I were looking for sort of in our paper, that you can't just have this sort of disunified part classical, part quantum um, theory in, in that form. Will it rule out every possible way of having classical gravity? Probably, you know, would it? Probably not. Um, but that's, I think, is kind of how it mostly goes in science. There's always sort of loopholes or other weird theories one might have. Okay, I hope that answers the, I hope that's some kind of answer to the question. I think we're going to have to leave it at that because we're already past the one thirty. John, I think you have time to follow up with Nick later on. Let me just remind you that please put your name on the sending sheet outside for contact tracing purposes. We have a talk tomorrow at 12, at 12 10 by Matt Parker, set of photo on what counts as evidence in a vast universe. So you're all invited to uh, come to that talk. That's very John. Who will be, I suppose, a possible target of that talk. Uh, interlocutor, maybe I should say. And there is no talk on uh, on on Friday. And thanks. Uh, oh, one more thing for Ali, since you actually were not in person, you don't have the oh to wow get <laughs> to get your own Thank umbrella. You. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you to all of you in, uh, online for for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.